Welcome to Thoughts Roundup. Hey, wait, 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 wait. He said, Are we getting started? Yeah, we're we're going right now. So I'm gonna, I'm hold gonna, on. I'm let gonna, me get my, let me let me pray. Jesus, help me. Let me God get my act together. In Jesus' Amen. name. Help him to get his act together. <laughs> All right. So so do I put uh got it. Got uh, it. Let, let me tell you, we're we've been on this whole time. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'm going to start over, start the program, and then I'll introduce you and <laughs> quit licking and carrying on. <laughs> I'm like a cat. I got to lick my, my paws. Yeah. I'm going to talk about some things, and then I'll bring you up. Welcome. Welcome to Thoughts Roundup. How nice it is to be with you today. I... Uh, this is the, uh, as some of you know, our 600th program. And I uh, wanted to do something special today for, the, for that program. You know, that's a lot of, 600 is a lot of anything. 600 pounds of potatoes is a, is a lot. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, 600 toes. If a man had 600 toes, that'd be a lot of toes. In fact, as he, he he had 599, too many. So anyway, we're glad to be with you today on the program number 600. And to do something special, I asked Brother Larry Booker and to come on the program because he is special to a lot of people. A lot of people love him. I can't figure out why, but they love him anyway. No matter what I would think about it. Brother Booker, thank you for being on the program. It is so good to be here and to celebrate your 600th birthday. I mean, or whatever this is. <laughs> That's his first jab, folks. <laughs> I'm just 599. That's what. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. And so, uh, you know, Bible people lived a long time. They did. <laughs> people like you so much. I said to myself, I'll get Brother Booker on this 600 program. He could say the Star Spangled Banner backwards. And they still like it. <laughs> Can you say the Star Spangled Banner? Banner? Banner Strangled. Banner Strangled. Star. Oh, why don't you try? See, can you say, oh. <laughs> See, can okay. you say, oh, <laughs> Strangled Banner's Star. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, there's no use for me to tell you this, Brother Booker, but I want you not to act like a guest. You, you're you used okay. to over things anyway. Just take over in time and get ready in. Do, well, do, I've been do. thinking about 600 and what it would like to to have 600. You said talk about 600 toes. <laughs> what if a guy had 600 fleas? 600 fleas. That would be a lot of fleas. Yes, it 600 would. grandkids Ooh, that you oh, got to buy for Christmas. That's worse than fleas. <laughs> <laughs> indeed. Indeed. <laughs> I'm happy to celebrate this milestone with you. Well, this is this is great. Thank you so very much. I, uh, I, I, I think that would be good for us if, if I think it'd be good for us to go over some of our preachers of the past. I think it'd be a good moment to to remember them. And yes. I jotted down a few, and anytime you want to interject uh, uh, someone, because it, it's hard, and, and I want the folks that's left of, of our good preachers that's gone not to hold me accountable because it's hard to get it all together and think this. But Brother Cullen Heyman, 
Brother Cullen Heyman was, I was raised on what Brother Cullen Heyman would think about it if he was still alive. And yeah. I'm going to tell you, my, my folks uh, honored and respected Cullen Heyman. And uh, then the best preacher that I've ever heard, and that's including you, Brother Booker, the best preacher I ever heard was George Glass Sr., and I'm sure that he can still be brought up and, and listen to some. And then there was V.A. Gidrose. Now, if you think of somebody, you, you go ahead and insert it because V.A. Gidrose, he was district superintendent of the state of Texas when Texas was all one district. And I'm going to tell you what, there was not a finer preacher and a finer man than Brother B.A. Gidrose. And then I better quickly mention my pastor, G.A. Mangan. That's Brother Anthony Mangan's father. There was no, no preacher like him to me. And uh, he had faith. He had zeal. Did you know Brother Mangan, they'd ask him to preach count meetings and conferences and he wouldn't go he said he was too busy at his home church he was wound up and bound up in in uh, alexandria that's exactly absolutely right. absolutely that's exactly right you know a lot of the names that you're mentioning um those are from a generation just ahead of me now, some of, many of them were, al were alive when I came to God, et cetera, but I never got to hear them. Hear them and know them. But I, every, every name that you've named, I've heard of them. I knew of them. I know their descendants. And um, they, were, they were very, very amazing people. And uh, I, I will tell you this, when you go down memory lane, I just recently drove through Oklahoma and uh, I was on my way to Missouri, and I'm driving through old familiar country because that's where I came to God. And names started coming to me. Now these these were noted men, and they were they they loomed large in my life. But I was thinking I'm driving through C. A. Nelson. Oh yes, and he's he's gone. Oh yes, and M. D. Deal, and he's gone. Yes, and R. D. Whalen. And he's gone. And E.G. Bass and Harold Ridenauer and e. Bass was and, from Oakdale, Louisiana. Go ahead. Yes, that's right. And uh, uh, brother, brother Bryant and the Cheryl brothers and and the list just went on and on and on. And I thought, this is I'm driving through a state that yeah. towering figures. They, they left big footprints and, and long shadows, and, and now they're gone, and there's a different generation come up now. Everyone is so I think I knew them. Yeah. When, you, when you're naming these names, I think it's important because, um, you know, this church didn't start yesterday, and we know when it started. But, boy, there's been a lot of uh, legs and efforts and millions of, of messages and studies and that have gone into making this thing what it is. And, oh, yeah. and I love to hear you talk about men that you knew. I, I've, I'm good friends with a man that he sat under G.A. Mangan's father. Brother Gibson, R.D. Gibson. No, well, no. no. Oh, oh, I was thinking about Sister Mangan. Oh, I'm yes. sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. This yeah. was Walter Mangan. Yeah. And uh, and uh, 31, yeah. he was up in Plymouth, Indiana. Yeah. And 31 preachers came out of that Plymouth, Indiana church, pastor by Walter Mangan. That's, that's, that's just, those are amazing statistics. Yeah. Just unbelievable. Yeah. I knew his wife, uh, but he was, well, I knew, I was doing when he was, but I never did get to meet him, I don't think. Yeah. Well, me neither. Me neither, but but it's something. Of course, you know, out here in California, 
the the legends were Paul Price. Yes. And nobody like him. Go go ahead. Uh, and uh, I H Terry. I H Terry. Everybody. Knows. Nobody. Nobody like him. Jimmy Davis. Yes. Howard Davis. We Harvey Paul Davis. Paul. Yeah. Lee Davis, these men, these men cut trails, and it, it it's just it's just utterly amazing. I think on the Davis brothers, I know a lot of men that preached for them. I, to the best of my knowledge, I'm the only one I held long revivals for the four Davis brothers in a row. Harvey, and then um, Jimmy. Howard and Lee in a, actually Lee, then Howard, all four in a row. And you talk about a study. That was, that was a study of, uh, of, of some really colorful, powerful characters. One of them was at Weed Patch, California. That's where Jimmy was in Weed Patch. Yes. He'd actually moved the church to the big sister city of Lamont. Yeah, I, uh, somebody took me there. I don't know if it's you or who it was, took me to the old spot. I was glad to just see the where it used to be. It, so yes. I had heard so much about it. That, that you, so you went to the white building that back in its day, he ran over a 500 people. Isn't that so? In that building there, 500 That was, that was when nobody hardly was running. No, that's exactly right. Uh, That's exactly right. uh, Well, uh, there was uh, 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 then Bill Starr, William Starr. uh, I'm bringing it back in our day, but I got to meet him. But that's all. Yeah, he was a great, great man. And then O.R. Foss. Yes. Now, uh, Brother Booker, there is some people that you know. I I didn't. Uh, some of my close friends, uh, it, be, it got to the place I didn't, you know, see eye to eye with them at all. But they're still my friends, and I yes, and I still love them. And uh, Kenneth Phillips, yes, everybody knows that your age or mine knows Kenneth Phillips. I went to Bible school with him. We went in the same car uh, to. Uh, to Brother Norris's school up in Minnesota. And uh, then there was Jack Dehart. Yes. Jack Dehart was, uh, he was all over. He was a home missions type guy. And he, he had a district office and they used him all over the country. And I preached for Brother Phillips. I preached for Brother Dehart. And then there was a, a man that's just like my brother. He was, I, I just could not separate hardly him from a real brother. And that was John Kershaw. Yes. And Kershaw, yes. Preached all he preached. It. I'll tell you what, <clears throat> if anyone got an invitation to preach a count meeting, you can probably just figure that he was too busy. Because that's he, exactly right. He was probably asked first. And uh, so uh, somebody asked me the other day, said, how do you think so-and-so got to preach that meeting? I said, well, Cody Marks was busy. (laughs) 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 No doubt. (laughs) That's the same way with John Kershaw. If somebody was preaching, it was because he was busy. (laughs) Yes. um, now, you know, here's one that we got to talk about just a little bit, and that's Charles Grisham. Charles Grisham. Wasn't he something? He was a really, truly great man. He was one of great the man. greatest preachers. People just loved him. He was just such a good man, and people just loved him. And yes, he preached all over the country. And, you know, he could be very humorous, very funny. He could tell some of those old stories and say it like the old country people used to say. Yes. And it was, Charles Grisham was the kind of man. Some of these men that you've mentioned, I've met. 
I got to meet them. Yeah. And I got to know Brother Kershaw just a little bit uh, at a couple of Texas camp meetings that I did. Oh. And I was so impressed with him. Yeah. He was um, he was very, very, very kind to me. But uh, Charles Grisham, he used to preach for me when I was up in Arroyo Grande. Oh, is that right? And, of course, he's out of uh, the old Williams Church. And I know a lot of people out of, out of uh, the Williams Church. But John, uh, Charles Grisham was the kind of guy, if you didn't like Charles Grisham, there's probably something wrong with you. You just check, better go yeah. alter and see if there's anything wrong just in case it might be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he just, just an amazing man. Amazing, amazing man. Really amazing. Here, here's a man that you have not ever heard of, I don't imagine. Erman Davidson? No, I don't know him. Well, he was secretary of the district in Texas for a long, long time. And when I went to Dallas to build a church, he was over in Richardson, right out of Dallas. And he helped me and my wife so much and he meant so very much to me and and then also another man that helped me tremendously uh whenever i went there and that was charles glass yes he was in sherman texas yes and he really did a a good work you ever heard of wayne pounders oh i knew him well oh did you he used to preach for him there in the ritter he was so loved Wayne Pounders. He was so descriptive. Yes. And you preach. Let that. me think. Yeah, he was into Ritter. That's right. Yeah. I love uh, Wayne Pounders. He could, he could, he would, he was so poetic and so descriptive in his preaching. And I complimented on him. He says, Well, I don't get any credit for that because he said, I think like that. I think in pictures and so forth. And so, well, I'll tell you one thing, I, I, I never got to that stage of the game where I could think in pictures and, and be poetic. A uh, man came to my church one time, and, and uh, I had introduced him as Ennis Bonnet. I had introduced him as one of the greatest orators that I had ever heard and my folks didn't know what this going to receive <laughs> and I just kept building it up building it up and so finally I turned the service to him the first night and he said uh, perhaps there's a lot of things I could say and perhaps there's a lot of things I should say however the urgency of the hour demands that I press into the message <laughs> so I will clamp the spurs to the bloodless sides of imagination and he said, at that moment, the evening, the evening began to weave a delicate web from the sinews of silence and spread it upon nature's body. And at home, when I got home, I said, and it's what did that mean? He said, the sun went down. So I said, from now on, I'm, if the sun go down, I'm just going to not try to be poetic with it. I'm just going to say the sun went down. So... <laughs> That's funny. Did your people have any idea what he was saying? They didn't know he came nor left. <laughs> he, he didn't impress anybody but me. <laughs> they went on with their uh, cornbread and beans and taters. <laughs> this goes back to uh, uh, words easily understood. It's, it's a big deal with God. <laughs> he kind of... <laughs> Somebody asked me one time, said, uh, do you get up about five o'clock to pray? I said, no, the Lord kind of wants to understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> I can't even talk at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I well understand. I well, well, well understand. Brother, look, I'm good. so sorry you don't have anywhere to preach. Well, you just you just do what you can with what you got. I did get to teach the Bible study here this morning in in Rialto. Let me ask you, how many do you know how many times a year you preach? Uh, per year? 
Yeah. I don't know. I, I heard Cody Marks the other night. I think he said he preached preached over 230 um, times last year. And uh, I know I'm nowhere near that. I'm nowhere well, near I don't that. know now. If if you, at home you preach and then every time I hear it, you, you would you you in one place one night and the next night you're somewhere else and that, you do that constantly. I thank you. For- you know, um, I, I've been asked about that, and uh, this this is kind of interesting, I think. But when I was a teenager, of course, I was a hooligan idiot. Yeah, and um, I never really dreamed I'd, I'd live to see thirty. And uh, I, I know that if God hadn't got a hold of me, I'd either be in the grave yeah. or in a penal institution or a mental institution. That I know. So, But I never thought I'd see 30. But I always had this feeling. There was two things I really deeply believed. Okay, One, I knew I would never live in Pueblo, Colorado, which is basically where I was raised. Yeah. I knew I'd never live there. And the second thing is I knew I would always travel a lot. Uh I just had that feeling. And, um, and so I never dreamed it'd be as a preacher, but I, I, I have traveled a lot, but OC Marler, the, I noticed that the sun doesn't exactly set on you, uh, the same place every day. You, you, you travel an awful lot and, uh, and uh, plus producing this, this, uh, I'm going to call it a podcast, but what you do, this is almost daily, and you're always in a different place. So it's, I don't know how you do it. You're 87. I don't know how you do it. Well, I, I thank you a lot. I thank you a lot. Somebody asked me one time, said, how, when do you feel your best? I said, whenever there's a, a smoke coming out of my tailpipe about Six or eight inches <laughs> But <laughs> You know, that's all going to shut down one of these days. Coast. Well, I was, uh, when I was, um, I remember the first time I ever rode in an airplane. It was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I got on a jet. It was 1974. And I was flying to the Louisville General Conference. And paid $64 for the ticket. I remember the plane taking off. I sat by the window on purpose. And just the thrill of that big old thing going so fast, faster and faster and faster, and finally getting off the ground. So the next, every time I'd ride a plane for the next years, whatever, I'd always do that. Well, after a while, you don't think about that anymore. So... I was 20, let's see, I was uh, 20, one or two years old when that happened. I'd be 21 years old. Well, the other day, the other day, a few months ago, I was flying back home into uh, Ontario Airport, Ontario, California, and I felt the landing gears go down. And when the landing gears went down, and you could hear the roar of the wind, I thought, okay, I'm 70 now. I'm no longer 21. And now what I'm noticing is the landing gears going down. And I said, that's just kind of indicative. That's kind of a message to you. (laughs) Where we're at in life, you know? Yeah. But uh, So I asked a pilot, I said, when those landing gears go down, how many more miles before you hit the ground? He said, between eight and 10. I said, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you're hoping for 10. Hoping for I 10. hope it's 10. I hope it's 10. And I, w- I want to tell the people something. You have made me think of something of all of all this taking off and his plane and all this stuff. I was at a conference about four or five years ago or more, and Joan was with me. And we had a Cadillac, and it was a hot car. 
And Brother Booker said, uh, oh, see, I'll, dr- I'll drive you the hotel if you want me to with the same hotel. Uh, I said, okay, just drive. And then I didn't like driving the town anyway. And there's a whole bunch of people out there in the front of the hotel. Now, folks, he got in that car and he mashed the gas, pressed the gas pedal all the way to the floor and it spun, (laughs) it kicked rubber. I want to tell you, I left a black mark and our heads went back, everything off the dash, everything in the car went back. That's stuff we never did find. And that, that's and and everybody was just so excited because he did us that way. You never have apologized for doing that. You you get that little old grin like a fox eating yellow jacket. <laughs> it, I just I don't know what got over me, but it just and uh, the one I really felt bad about was Joan. <laughs> <laughs> you, you didn't really bother me, but I, felt, I looked in the back seat. Poor Joan. Yeah, she, <laughs> but yeah. you, you were holding your chest. Yeah. Stuff was hitting her, spraying off. You know, because made me want to do better <laughs> housekeeping in my car. You know, I think start flying and stuff. Like that. I think you told somebody it took you a month to find your uh, your handicap sticker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Joan had a handicap sticker in there, and <laughs> we could have got in trouble. <laughs> but that's, that's well, see, that's how you're bragging on me. I'm gonna brag on you. And so, all you folks out there in uh, in uh, HGR land, please listen to this, ministers. I'm serious. You need to get Brother Marler to come to your church and there is any preach, any message he's ever preached is worth listening to. I promise. I'm not just saying that. I mean it, but you need to have him come and uh, preach a message. And if I don't have this title exactly right, brother model, you fix it, but it is what every saint owes to every visitor to every service. If that's not close, it's it's, and it is one of the greatest, most profound messages that I have personally ever heard. And when he preached it at our church, he was very sick. Uh, he he caught a bug that day, and uh, he had to visit the trash can five times before he preached. And I, I was telling him, "Don't even go to church." He would. He's no, no. I'm going. I'm going. We said, okay, stay in the office after the choir's done. We'll come get you when it's just right. And um, and so when it got done, the cadets went and got him. He went to the pulpit. They put a trash can by the pulpit just in case he got sick again. But he brought the house down. And I could almost cry right now. Um uh, when, when he was finished, uh, folks, I'm not trying to over-dramatize, but it's almost like we were crawling to the altars. And we just turned the lights down, and everybody le- prayed and laid there for a long, long, long time. And I'm just of the personal opinion that every church needs to hear Brother Marla preach that message. I, I'm, I'm as serious as I can be. I really am, because that was a profound message. Well, I I thank you so very much, Brother Booker, and I'm humbled by that. Uh, but I do remember very vividly how the feeling. Well, I tell you what, <clears throat> we're running out of time here. I can see by what they used to say by the old clock on the wall, but this is coming up on the screen, so I guess we'll – that's a good way to get us off. But I tell you what, I appreciate it very much you being with me. And I love you, and I love your family. You have a great family and a wonderful wife. And uh, 
Thank you for and you've been good to my family. I appreciate it so very much. Thank you. Well, we love we love Brother Marley very much. Love his family. Love all that you have done for the kingdom. You are doing for the kingdom. And um, so we're just kind of closing out here, scratching each other's back. <laughs> That's right. That's, that's exactly what somebody's got to take care of us. Yes, we have to take care of each other. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, if we don't take care of each other, who's yeah, going to take care of us? Jesus has brought us this far. Yeah, we need each other. Far. And so, listen, I love you. We're running out of time. And thank you very much for, for being All on. right. God bless you, man. Love you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening.